Hello everyone, my name is Carl, and I have just obtained a game with quite a story behind it. Maybe you've already heard about Zack and his NES Godzilla cartridge? I wasn't aware of it until I saw the eBay auction, and it really grabbed my interest. I skimmed through the recounting of what the game supposedly did. I wasn't sure what to make of it, but something about the whole thing just captivated me, and I decided to buy the game. I thought if nothing else, I'd get a new game and a nice conversation piece. I used to buy it now and got it for a decent price, $10 including shipping. Zack sent me an email and we talked for a bit. He seems like a decent guy despite being a bit... loopy and dramatic. He made it clear that he was dead serious about the game being unnatural and dangerous. I still wasn't entirely convinced myself, but I played along. About myself and the game. I actually never played NES Godzilla, at least not with the actual cartridge. After I won the bit, I played the game on an emulator a bit to see what it was like, and also so I could point out noticeable differences, if there were any, later on. The first two worlds were decent fun, but it got boring pretty quick. Also, I'm not a Godzilla expert. I liked watching the movies when I was a little kid, but that was a long time ago. I hardly remember any of the monsters, except for the really famous ones, like Rodan and Mothra. So if the game starts throwing a bunch of obscure Godzilla-related stuff at me, I might not catch it. And here is the game cartridge itself. There's nothing visibly wrong with it. No weird marks or anything that would make it stand out. If it got misplaced and sorted in with some regular games, you would never know the difference. I haven't actually started playing the game yet. I'm still in the process of hooking up the TV to the computer so I can take screen caps in the event that things get interesting. For now, here's a photo I took of the title screen starting up. The connection between the TV and computer is all set and ready to take screenshots. I guess I'm ready to begin too. Here goes nothing. Okay, so the opening screen looks the same. If this is like Zack's game, there won't be anything noticeable until the first boss fight, but I'm going to be disappointed if this whole game ends up playing normally. Only a few seconds in and already something's off. I almost didn't notice, but the last game option? It's gone. I don't know why, as usually would have done the same thing as New Game. Oh god, I really hope this doesn't mean that I can't save. I don't want to have to play this entire game in one sitting. Maybe the world titles will work as passwords or something. Eh, no way to know until I start playing, I guess. It skipped the Solar System intro entirely. That's a shame, I like that music. What the... What is this? This isn't what the Earth board is supposed to look like. And I don't have Godzilla or Mothra? Holy shit. Looks like I don't have to worry about not seeing anything new. Nothing in that above screenshot was in the original game besides the life meter. I don't think any of it was in Zachary's playthrough either. The only other thing that seems to have remained the same is the music. My lone playable character is this blue dinosaur. Since the meter refers to it as Godzilla, I assume this is him prior to getting mutated. So, no heat beam yet. It can only attack by punching and biting. There isn't much in this jungle aside from other dinosaurs. The pterodactyls dive bomb me when I get close, but most of the others either attack or run away. Sometimes when I kill one of these I get a health power up, which looks the same as the original. It's a pretty short level. I got to the end in less than two minutes. I'll, uh, I'll try the blue and yellow icon next. This level is a beach, as you can see. Those little crabs are a pain. They jump and latch on while draining health. But thankfully, they don't take much punishment and give health when they die, so it balances out. Only problem? They're everywhere in this level. I try to jump over them when I can. In the second half of the level, there's less of the crabs, thank god, and more of these aquatic dinosaur fish enemies that emerge from pits. I've played quite a few platformers in my day, so this is nothing difficult. It isn't scary either, but it's giving me a weird feeling. It's hard to explain, but it's like if I hadn't tried out the real game before, I might not have known anything was out of place. For a supernatural game, so far it's just playing like a normal game, but not the game that it should be. 
None of these dinosaurs or levels are supposed to be here, and I have no idea where they came from. This third level is very glitched. No enemies at all, and my Godzilla dinosaur is flashing and his body parts are rearranging themselves with every step. The music is similarly distorted. It's slowed down and has a lower pitch. I was going through the level trying to figure out what went wrong with it, when I suddenly got attacked by a very glitched Ghidorah. I almost freaked out because there's no way I would win a fight against Ghidorah like this. But then the game froze and made a loud buzzing sound. Then it returned to the board like nothing happened. W weird. The last level type is another jungle. It has the exact same graphics, but this time it's set at night. The dinosaurs here are different and a lot more aggressive. They come from the left and the right sides of the screen, so I have to pay attention to both. I'm attacking the small dinosaurs for the power-ups and avoiding the rest, because I'm fairly certain the Triceratops at the end of the board is a boss fight of some kind. I don't know what to expect from it, but I don't want to be low on health either way. The level is longer than the others, and I notice a strange kind of teamwork occurring with the enemies. The blue raptors will follow my dinosaur around and keep jumping at him, knocking me back into the path of the larger ones. There's another dinosaur of the same color that does a similar thing, charging at me and inflicting damage until I either get away or kill them. It's like these dinosaurs hate me for some reason. Here I am at the boss fight. There's a nuke going down in the background, and the battle is timed at one minute. This must be the decisive hour when the dinosaur becomes Godzilla. I guess this Triceratops must be the strongest animal on the island, a rival. Better take him down now, or else a very different king of the monsters will arise. He doesn't have much attack variety. He seems to be limited to charging. I jump when he doesn't and then assault him with everything I've got, which isn't much. He went down with only four seconds to go. No time to outrun the bomb, but it seems I wasn't supposed to. A cutscene starts to play. When it ends, the game goes back to the game select menu. New game has been replaced by continue. And that's World 1. For my first impressions, I'm not sure what to say. I feel a bit overwhelmed. Where did all of this come from, and, and why? I'm not sure what to think about this game. I sent my Chapter 1 right up to Zack to get his thoughts on it. See if he could give an insight on what it was doing. I, I told you before, I don't know how the game does these things. If you're suggesting I put these graphics in the game myself, you're mistaken, because this is the first I've seen any of it. It looks like the game has recreated itself again since I played it. That's not a good sign. Not a very helpful response, but oh well. I don't know what I expected him to say anyway. As for the game, I'm heading into World 2 today. It's called Galid. No more actual planets? Well, here's the Galid board. Glad to see that I actually have Godzilla now. There's quite a variety of levels here. That evil looking symbol at the bottom right must be my exit. I hope I don't meet up with red in here. By pressing select on the level icons, I discovered that all these levels have their own names, which are Tundra, Ice Cave, Isolation Zone, Lost Way, Temple of Silence, and Sin. The first two sound reasonable enough, but the others I have no idea. I'll start with a Tundra level. The Tundra is about what I expected. It's quite pretty to look at. Godzilla plays like normal, but he moves slightly faster, which is nice. The music here is a new track which has a subtle yet foreboding vibe to it. It has a definite wintry sound and seems more advanced than the usual NES music. Stage creatures are no longer dinosaurs. Instead, the tundra is populated with various weird beasts. I suspect this will be the case for the rest of the game, but I don't know for sure. There's not a whole lot going on in here. I don't have to use many attacks because most of the creatures here are non-aggressive. It's actually rather calming. The snowfall has turned into a blizzard. It's hard to see, and I'm coming across more and more bodies buried in the snow. The snow went berserk and made it almost impossible to see when I reached the end of the level. When it started coming down like this, I could tell that my observation time was over, so I got to the end quickly. There wasn't much resistance from enemies. Actually, I didn't come across anything living near the end. Alright, on to Ice Cave. 
After having to deal with the blizzard, I'm somewhat glad that this level is quote-unquote indoors. I can't go left for obvious reasons, so I head to the right. The music is very... odd. Somewhere between relaxing and mind-numbing. These blue creatures are enemies that chase me around. They don't deal much damage, but I prefer to outrun them, trying to conserve my health here. There are numerous spiked pits I have to jump over. It's tricky to do so without running into the beasts. You can see me failing at that in the screenshot. I also have trouble with these things that use freezing breath. They seem to hone in on my presence and wait to attack at the most inconvenient spot. The level ends with a mini boss fight against this crystal covered creature. There's very little room to move without getting stabbed by icicles, though the boss doesn't seem affected by them. He moves fast and can spin in the air, but he's not much tougher than the other enemies. The first real boss is a crab called Ganymaze. Maybe that's a Godzilla monster? I've never heard of it before. The fight was quite easy. The crab moves forward and back while snapping with its claws, then jumps and spits. I made short work of it by constantly kicking it in the face. Things are going pretty well so far, but I am only halfway through. This level is some kind of platform in space surrounded by floating crystals. Very slow and lonely sounding music playing in here. Some of the crystals have baby-like things inside them, which I can knock out by punching the crystal. When I punch an empty crystal, it takes me to a small, boxed-in area. I went into four crystal rooms. The first was the screenshot above, the second was the same, except the room was empty. The third sent me to a frozen corridor where I had to run past snake monsters that emerged from holes in the wall. And the fourth sent me to this little character. I walked up to him and a tech screen came up. He had something to say. The first man to walk on the moon was Ezekiel Zanderfruit. Um, citation needed? No, seriously, I don't get it. And that was the end of the level, apparently. Another boss fight. This time the opponent is a giant turtle called... Kamebus? Kamebus? I don't know how to pronounce these names. It's slower than Ganymede and doesn't have any ranged attacks. But it's more damage resistant, and it doesn't seem to move in a set pattern. Sometimes, it extends its neck out to bite me, but that's easily avoided. I'm getting a little concerned by how low my health is. I can only hope the game increases my life meter soon. Lost Way is also a floating level like Isolation Zone, except with a cloudy background and numerous platforms. The music is actually pretty gentle and calm. It sounds like a lullaby. I proceeded in the direction of the arrows, though I would have gone to the right anyway. This level has me on edge because I can't always tell if I'm going to land on a platform when I jump or if I'll just make Godzilla fall to his death. It might seem like the platforms are densely packed from the screenshots, but it's more like there are clusters of platforms throughout the levels, some of which have wide spaces in between them. I'm having to make many leaps of faith. There are plenty of creatures here, some of which are enemies from previous levels. Among them is the Ice Breather. Damn it. It's easier to get rid of them here than it was in the caves because I can make them fall off the blocks. I kill all the ice breathers I see to prevent having one of them freeze me mid-jump. That would be disastrous. After wandering around for a few minutes, I found this platform of gold blocks that moves up and down. It took me to an area with a blue dinosaur. Also, why is everything blue in Galid? Which I thought was an enemy at first, but instead of attacking me, it started following me around. As the dinosaur and I march on, we see many other creatures wandering around, looking just as confused as us. That's when I realized that the arrows don't actually lead anywhere. They're intended to lead the occupants of this place into dead ends. So, now I'm ignoring the arrows and instead looking for the gold blocks. I've got no idea which direction the exit might be, but I have a hunch that those will lead me to it. There's also something that looks like a floating blob of snow. I don't know what that's about. After using two more gold elevator blocks, we found this little guy who spoke. I am Esau. I don't know how I got here. Please help me. I felt sorry for the poor what's it, so without even thinking about it, I blurted out, Sure. Thank you. He responded to what I said, and that freaked me out. I hadn't pressed any buttons or anything, but Usal heard my voice somehow. It made me jump, but he seems harmless enough, so I'm going to keep on looking for the exit. And we found the exit. Took about six minutes of backtracking, the exit ended up being somewhere behind the spot where I started. Alright, next up is Temple of Silence. Right from the start, an enemy comes crawling at me. It's this slug-looking thing with its arms tied and mouth sewn shut. Has no attacks except running at me. There is no music or any other sound here. 
There's a lot of enemies in this level. I'm attempting to jump over or run past them. The temple appears to be nothing but a hallway of enemies. Got to the edge of the hall. There was a drop which put me in another hall beneath the first one going back to the left. I don't have a lot to say about this level, except that it has some damn strange looking enemies in it, and the complete lack of sound gives me an uncomfortable feeling. Not to mention the statues. Here I am going through the end of the level. Lots of those ugly multi-face head things are floating around. And that's the last of the Galid levels. Well, almost. Still gotta get through Sin. Before I dive in there, I'm trying to figure out what this might be. The name is very vague, but it suggests that this will be something unpleasant. The level icon gives me no hints. Yeah, I don't know. Here goes nothing. It's a boss fight! I should've known. As soon as I heard the music, I could tell this would be a boss. Got up close and heat beam, but it kicked me. It didn't do much damage, but I've only got four bars left, so I can't take too many hits. I try to run up and hit him and get smacked aside. If I'm too far away, he starts using a freezing beam out of his eye. The only way to beat him is to keep moving constantly. The hyperactive squirrel method of battle proved to be a winner. Lethar eventually grabbed Godzilla, and that's when he got a heat beam to the face. After Lethar died, an image of a gate appeared on the screen. It had seven holes. One had Lethar's icon in it, and the other six were empty. After pressing start, I'm sent back to the title screen. I'm going to turn the game off for now. Well, that was insane. While playing the game, I got so wrapped up in it that I sort of forgot that none of this should have been happening. The game does seem to follow specific themes, with everything in Galid being cold and blue, but for the most part, ugh, I feel like there's a traffic jam going on in my brain. I need a break. Instead of immediately heading into World 3, I've decided to play around with the password screen today. I don't know what results I'll get, assuming I get any in the first place. It's the same weird, creepy music playing, but the password input has been altered. Left, right, and end characters are gone. B and A move the second selector around while start inputs the code. There's a new icon in their place, which is in some language I haven't seen before. First, I'll try world names from Zack's playthrough. Pathos didn't work. Trance also didn't work. Dementia, nada. Entropy, screen turned white for a second, but then went back like nothing happened. I entered the code again, and it was rejected. Exodus, nope. Zenith, didn't work, but I'm not sure I wanted to go there anyway. So, I can't access any of the worlds that Zack did. Not only that, I can't even get to the worlds that I've already played. Galid didn't do anything either. That leaves trying passwords from the original game and guessing. I'll have to Google search to see what those were. Alright, so after five minutes I found some. I tried the sound test and destroy all monsters codes and they both worked. The CD player guys don't do anything as far as I can tell. The sound test is only playing songs that I've heard in the game so far. It probably updates the song library as the player progresses. The Destroy All Monsters code sends me to this area where I'm a robot that uses a club to kill little monsters. There's no health, time limit, or anything. The password music plays in the background. This made me feel uneasy, so I didn't play it for long. Now that I've gone through all my other options, I'm going to see what that new language icon does. Whoa! I don't understand this at all. I'm glad I still have the option of going back to English, but first I'll input a password using this and see what happens. To my surprise, that random input got a result. Another odd game. The only objective is to get blood samples from each of these monsters to put into beakers. Don't know what the 120 means. It was there the whole time. After doing so, it goes back to the password screen. Tried another combination and got yet another little game. How many games are in this thing? This time, a little yellow mouse and a robot on the ocean. Just swimming along. Row, row, row your butt. Why did everything go dark? Damn! How was I supposed to avoid that? I input the same code trying to start over, but it didn't work this time. Uh, so much for that one. I'll try one more. I have no idea what's going on here. Maybe it's a race, but I don't seem to be getting closer to anything. When I backpedal, the flying thing follows me. I rode around for a few more minutes, but nothing else happened. These password games are certainly interesting, but they're quite fruitless. There's still one word I want to try out, though, but I'll need to go back to the English screen. Xander Fruit. And it had a result! 
The Transcendence Project. Now I'm intrigued. It looks as like this might give me some answers as to what this game is about. What really caught my attention is the blood red text stating, do not redistribute this cartridge. Clearly someone did not want this game being passed around. It's a bit too late for that, but as the current owner, I really want to know why it shouldn't be redistributed. Oh, come on! Just when I think I'm getting somewhere, it wants another password. What does this thing need authorization for? What the hell is a Transcendence Project anyway? Ugh, I guess I won't be finding out, at least not right now. Maybe another creature will give me the authorization code later in the game. I should have gone to work today, but I decided to stay home quote-unquote sick. I'm not really that sick, but I haven't slept very well for the past few days. Not because of nightmares, certainly not. I haven't remembered my dreams for a long while. But because I can't stop thinking about the game. I'm enjoying the game somewhat, but... I'm getting this feeling that if I keep playing, I'm going to see something that I shouldn't. Anyway, I don't see much point in messing around with the password screen any longer until I have some combinations that will get real results. And the only way to get those is to go through the game, so on to World 3. World 3 is Corona. It has a purple board and four level types. This world probably won't take long to complete. The boss is only three spaces above my starting point. That strikes me as a little odd since the Galid boss was like 15 spaces away. Since the path is so short, I could get through in a few minutes, but I'm not going to try to rush it. The levels here are called Power Plant, Reflect, Patser, and Forest. And there's one other boss, which is King Kong. It surprises me to see such a big name character showing up. I'm not aware of any connection between Godzilla and Kong but I guess it doesn't matter. Power Plant is a dark, ominous looking level of granite bricks, storm clouds, and power poles. The efficiency of this place is questionable since the power poles lack connective wires. The music has a sort of electronic synth sound to it. Going further on, I encounter some peculiar enemies and see that a few of the power poles have electric chairs connected to them, some of which are occupied by dead or soon to be dead creatures. Every minute or so, a bolt of lightning will strike down and light up the screen. The power poles appear to function as a combination of a lightning rod and a generator. Getting their power from lightning strikes, which kill the creature in the chair as the electricity surges downward. So, it's both a power plant and an execution field. Lovely. Since these poles attract the lightning, the only danger of being shocked is if I stand right next to one when it gets hit. Not too hard to get around, but with all these sad things screaming in pain as their brains get fried, it's not a welcoming atmosphere. The level is a straight walk to the right, so with no potential for exploration, I make my way through quickly. Reflect is a castle-esque level with a lot of mirrors. It has a strange background and equally strange music. Like the crystals in Isolation Zone, the mirrors here serve as teleporters. It takes some guessing as to which mirror to go through, but the level doesn't seem very large. I can only hope I'll be shown some indication that I'm progressing towards the end instead of going around in circles. The mirrors here are different from crystals in that creatures can come through the mirrors at random. Usually it's those little flying creatures made of broken glass in the first screenshot. I hate those bastards because you can take damage if you touch them. While traversing, I found another creature that talks. I am the prettiest thing that could ever be. I tried to get it to tell me a password, but it was too preoccupied to listen. It took a little while, but eventually I got to this mini-boss, who I assume is guarding the exit. He moves quick, sure, but he can't do much damage. I've got the advantage this time, since there's a lot more space to move around, so his lightning bolt is easily avoided. Now what do we have here? Ah! Rodan! A monster that I actually recognize! That's great, can't wait to test him out. Wait, I just remembered I haven't fought King Kong yet. I'm tempted to use Rodan, but I'll use Godzilla for this one. I don't know what to expect. Damn, he's tougher than I expected. He's dodging my attacks and knocking off too much of my health. In the middle of the fight, the game suddenly started to glitch very badly. Weird, but I'm not complaining. Now it's Rodan time. On to Patser. Before the level starts, I'm told to seize a king. Oh, I get it. It's a chess-themed level. It doesn't involve actually playing chess, though. That's a damn good thing, because I haven't played chess in eight years. 
Rodan's a great addition, does almost everything Godzilla can, and he can also fly. It's only my first impression, but he seems like a promising character, and I'm sure the flying will come in handy later. As for the level, the black and white chess guys can't pay much attention to me since they're also fighting each other. That makes flying around and looking for one of the kings simple. I don't think it matters which king I get, so I'm just going to go after the first one I see. Aha! There's one! So I go up and hit him, and then the level ends with another info screen telling me that black team wins. That's great for the black team. I'm glad that level's over because it was starting to mess with my eyes. Let's see what the forest is like. Yep, looks like a typical forest level. Music is unnerving. Going to the right as usual. Out of nowhere, these huge bat things start dive bombing from the trees. They're hunting down the brown creatures. Trying to get out of the way before I get bit. I got away from the sideways mouth bats. There weren't many of them. Not much of anything down through here. Why did everything lose color? And the music changed, but... Um... You don't know why. I don't know what the hell that was. Maybe, maybe I should just turn this thing off. Then again, all I have left to do is the boss fight. This guy is a lot more mobile than Lethar was. He also uses his ranged attack almost constantly. Normally this would just drain his power down to nothing, except that he can go up to the top of the arena, get hit by lightning, and become recharged. I can get in some easy hits while he does this, but once he gets powered back up, he immediately does a lightning attack that fills the length of the screen. He doesn't seem to have any attacks other than lightning though, so I wait for that power meter to go down and then hit him with everything I've got. It's just a matter of time. And with one good kick to the face, he is done. I don't know why, but for some reason it feels really good to see another symbol in that wall. I would like to see the thing complete, but maybe that's not such a good idea. That thing in the forest gave me a really bad feeling. And it's not going to be happy if it knows I'm coming back. I'm still having trouble getting to sleep. Ever since starting the game, I've had this weird anxious feeling, like I need to be ready for something. I'm not entirely pleased with what I've seen. That gray creature gives off a very bad vibe. But I'm not ready to quit just yet. World 4. Amorphous. Amorphous is a green board with four level types. They are called Ruin, Falls, Reef, and Depth. I'm going to start with Ruin. Ruin is a level of flooded temple ruins. It has a dismal atmosphere to it. Some of the platforms sink into the water after being stepped on. I don't know if the water is harmful or not, but I'm not going to chance it. I've noticed a pattern. Creatures that stand still when you walk up to them are usually okay to talk to. The things that are constantly moving around either don't respond or they attack. Right here is a something that's standing still, so I'll say hello. Why can't, Why can't I, I be strong? strong? It's, it's not, not fair. fair. He seems bitter. Since I'm conversing with one of these, I'm going to ask it something I wanted to find out, which is how exactly these creatures can hear what I'm saying. I hear, I hear with my ears. He's a little smartass, apparently. I doubt he'll be saying anything useful, so I'm moving on. The level is sparsely populated by creatures. Most of them are these things that leap up and bite. I'm glad I'm going through here with Rodan because I can fly over them. After browsing through the level for a minute, I found Usal. Let's see how he's doing. I, I used, used to have, to have a home here. here. It, wasn't it wasn't always, always like this. this. He's not doing too well. The poor guy's lost his home from the sound of it. I don't know what to do other than to say I feel bad for him. It's a really strange feeling trying to comfort something that lives in a video game. Then I ask him if he knows anything about a password. I know a password. 121-90415. I don't know what this does. Don't tell me when I gave you this. They might come after me. I feel conflicted by Usul's response. While I'm happy that I got a password, I'm also worried by this they that he mentions. Who are they and why would they come after him? I try to ask him to explain, but he starts to fly away. Might as well see what this password does. Heading back to the Transcendence Project, and... We're in! It's rather strange that Usul got a code that works for this. I was under the impression that his world was separate from this game menu stuff. 
Makes me curious as to how he got it, but anyway, let's see this project. It appears to be some kind of journal with separate entries as readable text scrolls. This makes no sense. Why is there a written document about the cartridge in the cartridge? How did it get there? Did this doctor disassemble it and encode his own journal into the game? Why would he do that? Ugh, nothing to do with it to start reading. It reads as follows. Game cartridge was sent to me via anonymous donation. A letter was included warning of strange occurrences regarding the game. I am taking it to my lab for proper testing. Ran preliminary tests today. I have determined that the game is an anomaly. Further testing is needed. Seems as if someone donated this game to a lab and some scientists ran tests on it. The journal doesn't say who the donor was or how they knew where to send the game. Nor does it say what exactly the problem with the game is. It's only referred to as an anomaly. The rest of the entries describe tests done with the game. I'll post screencasts to some of the more interesting ones. First test with human controller. Game starts normally, controller completes World 1. World 2 is entirely different. Game displays unexplained new content. Other signs of anomaly. Controller is confused and ends up at a game over. On second attempt to play the game, game is completed with no signs of anomaly. Test with animal controllers. Attempted interactions between cats, dogs, mice, and the game. Game displayed no signs of anomaly. Conclusion, game requires human connection to generate signs of anomaly. Two-person interaction. After several attempts, interaction between two people and the game anomaly appears to be impossible. Game is somehow aware of more than one person watching it at the same time. If this happens, anomalies will not occur. Conclusion, game anomaly requires a connection with a single human. Interruptions cause connection to fail. Second controller test continued. Controller 2 is progressing through the game without interruption. Anomalies have occurred. Most notable is that Controller 2 recognizes things from his early life. Controller 2's game is largely different from that of Controller 1 in preliminary. The only constant appears to be the presence of Godzilla monsters within the game. Transcendence. The game anomaly appears to create a connection between a human and another realm, with a kind of connection to that person. I believe there is much to be learned through these interactions. I have classified my notes as the Transcendence Project, and I hope to discover more of the game's secrets. The last two entries are alarming. Group Test Day 9. Jeremy was rushed to the hospital after having an epileptic seizure during test. His family has a history of epilepsy, but he has had no prior seizures. Jeremy claims that it was brought on by a devil he encountered in the game. Jeremy also claims that the anomalies are demonic in nature. He has since left the project. Group Test Day 13. Jeremy's incident has left a strong impression on the group. Out of the original eight, only three are continuing with the tests. Their fears and anxiety seem to be making an impression on their game worlds. I worry that this may attract malignant entities. None of the controllers have completed their respective games as of this time. <sighs> to be honest, I, I really didn't believe a lot of Zachary's testimony about how his game ended. W with the paralysis and all that. I figured he was playing some weird modded game and was getting caught up in his own imagination. But this bit about Jeremy having a seizure, that's making me rethink it. And judging from this, Zack is the only person to have completed the game in its anomaly form. Group Test Day 13, dated September 21st, 1997, is the last entry in the journal. Either the project was abruptly ended at this point, or the rest of the journal has not been recorded on this. While this does give a bit of insight about the game, it raises more questions than it answers. Assuming that this is even legitimate, that is. These entries are very short for what's supposed to be a professional experiment. But regardless of whether or not it's real, I still don't understand how it's even in the game in the first place. The journal itself isn't lending me any answers, and I don't see anything else to look at on this page except the journal entries. So I'm going back to Amorphous to complete it. Falls is a waterfall level. Mostly the same as Ruins, just walking through and jumping over pits. Enemies here are the 1998 Godzilla, a giant lobster, and some more of those jumping creatures. The music is faster in pace and sounds more threatening. The end of the level has you right at the waterfall, having to jump across blocks that come down the falls. Very much like those parts in Super Mario Bros. 2, except that it's a little harder because Godzilla's jumping is kind of awkward. Jumping creatures come down from the top of the screen every few minutes. With falls completed, it's time for another boss. Dagara is an aquatic reptile that alternates between crawling and flying around. When he flies, he releases starfish that attach to Godzilla and then explode. 
His last trick is to spin around rapidly, creating a whirlwind that blocks the heat beam and makes it hard to attack him. The only thing that works against this is the tail whip. From there, it's on to Reef. In this underwater stage, Godzilla can actually swim. I don't recall him doing that in the game before. I'm very glad to see more health boosters. That bastard dagger nearly took out Godzilla. Godzilla actually handles it better underwater than he does on land, although there are some drawbacks. He can't kick or tail whip unless you go to a service and stand on it. The fish are peaceful, but the octopus will try to grab Godzilla if he gets too close. And there's more lobsters. They also move faster underwater. An unsettling sight here, a creature tied to a rock. He must have gotten on someone's bad side and they decided to drown him. At the end of Reef is a mini-boss, a long-necked aquatic dinosaur. He fights a lot like Godzilla, but he doesn't have a heat beam. Instead, he opens up his tail and knocks back with a blast of air, water, whatever it is. Lack of ranged weapons make him easier to deal with than Dagara was. Depth is another swimming stage, this time at the ocean floor. Very eerie music, and it's hard to see. Not a good sign. I don't know what this is supposed to be, but I don't like it. Uh-oh, looks like the drowning wasn't an isolated incident. At least there's spare health laying around. These enemies don't give any after being destroyed. God only knows what I might run into down here. Like this dragon. I thought this was going to be a problem at first, but when I went to cross, he just stood there and let me. Which is nice. Maybe if I keep going left, I'll find the exit. Nope! Alright, after 10 minutes of swimming around, I seem to be getting somewhere. I figure I'm at the ocean floor. Nowhere lower to be, so the direction to go is up. Freakish mermaids have started swarming on me, so I must be close. Going up led me out of the depths and into a waterfall stage. This one is set at night. I ran into this green character here. And then this happened. Hi there! You don't know me, but I was the one who helped you defeat Kong. If we work together, I think we can win this! Uh, I think I know who Usal's afraid of. I told you to leave. You know what? No. Let's see how he likes getting blasted. This is your last warning. I wonder why he left after being attacked. Too cowardly to stay and fight? I highly doubt it. This fight was fairly easy until Odia gave me a surprise. Turns out it can shapeshift. What's worse is that not only is its heat beam as powerful as mine, now it moves even faster. It switches between Godzilla and its true form every few seconds. After losing a lot of life, it dives downward towards some underwater caves. Odia hides inside them and sticks its head out to spew green spheres, which stick and make it hard to move. Then Odia rushes forward to ram Godzilla into spiked walls. It's an interesting tactic. In fact, I think I'm going to use it myself. Another one bites the dust. And there's another world completed. I wonder what happened to those people who were part of the project. Today we go into World 5. The gate has seven slots on it, so this is the halfway point. Tempest. The board is a dark bluish color. It's got three level types. Top, Swamp, and Fog. I'm going to start with Top. Top takes place on the top of a mountain range. You can't see it in the screen caps, but this area has very strong winds. I'm going to need to pay attention so I don't plummet while moving. There's an eerie feeling to this place. Rather low tone music, but it's hard to hear over the sounds of howling wind. There are two kinds of gross bug enemies. They seem to be related. Both of them try to stab me with the face spikes. I'm starting to see body parts flying across the screen when the wind picks up. I'm running into these odd lump things with holes all over them. The bugs hover around it, sticking their spikes into the holes, and they attack me whenever I get close, so I have to destroy all of them before I can get across. It's getting difficult to avoid these things. Well, I can see the bodies that have been flying past earlier. They're covered in circular holes, probably stabbed to death by the bugs. There are also pink eggs bound in the mountains by a sticky web-like substance. Small larval bugs leap from the eggs and drain health, but I've also seen them emerge on their own to feed on the bodies. I've gotten to a clearing that seems mostly free of bugs, and look who shows up! Usol! I can't find my family. They're probably dead. Oh, goodness, that's terrible to hear. Wait, what is that thing? 
Having fun yet, idiot? You have to play games here because your real life is worthless. You have nothing else. <laughs> that hairy asshole grabbed Usol and disappeared. And I like the little guy, so this pisses me off. I hope I can get him back. Eh? Huh? There's a new monster on the board. Didn't unlock it in the level. I guess it's just the game being weird. Who knows? I'll try him out in the swamp level. His name is King Caesar. He's some sort of dog monster. He might be made of rock. The swamp is like a combination of the forest and ruin levels. Don't know about the water, but I'm staying out of it. I'd rather not take my chances, and I don't think a rock dog is going to be a good swimmer. The music has a primordial sound. It's like a slow knocking on wood. A lot of background noise in this level too. Gurgling and whistling sounds. The lump things are here, but the other enemies are different. One is a long-necked creature with spikes that tries to stab me from the water. The others are toads that jump everywhere. They aren't strong and they give health when killed, but they show up frequently. King Caesar is fairly conventional for a playable monster, though jumping is weird. He falls slower than Godzilla and he seems rather light on his feet, but that's not a big issue. One thing I really like is that he can aim his beam up and down, which should come in handy. A tree with syringe needles coming out of the branches? I'm just gonna jump over it. What the hell? I got hit by one of the needles and it looks like it's injected Caesar with psychedelic drugs. Everything's wobbling rapidly and changing colors and the music is messed up. I can't play the game like this. I have to wait for this to wear off. Ugh, this is making me dizzy. Alright, two minutes and it wears off. I'm definitely going to avoid those trees from now on. Going through the swamp, encountering more of the same. Huh, I think we're at a boss. Yep, definitely a boss. The giant toad is trying to eat Caesar, and his tongue is both his primary weapon and his weak point. Striking it just gets me stuck to it, so I have to use the beam. Its arsenal is limited, but the toad can birth many smaller toads out of the holes in its back. After taking enough damage, the giant toad retreats momentarily to let its spawn wail on me. They come at a constant rate, but by unrelentingly beating the hell out of them, it's a good way to gain health before the big one resurfaces. After doing this about three times, the giant toad goes kaboom! Look at those fireworks! King Caesar is quite effective, though these levels seem a bit easy. I was expecting things to get harder by this point. Megagirus is a monster dragonfly. You might notice it starts out with an empty power meter, which had me confused at first. But it turns out that Megagirus gains energy by draining yours and then uses your own beam against you. An annoying trick, but Megagirus lacks any real strength, so it's just a matter of getting enough hits in. Fog is another ruin temple. This one is somehow floating in the sky along with several large rocks. This area has less gravity than normal. There's music playing that sounds kind of like a whistle, but it's hard to hear over the wind. I'm having some trouble with these lizard-like enemies. They stab with their tongues and will chase me around until I get rid of them. And here's where the level gets its name from. Every now and then the fog rises up from the bottom to obscure the view. That's the last thing I need when I'm trying to jump across flying rocks. I have to fend off enemies while waiting for the fog to go back down, and some of the lizard things can fly. Thankfully, this level is rather short. At the end, there's this thing, which blocks me from getting through. It's not much of a mini-boss. All it can do is wave its tentacles and call other enemies. I met another denizen here, and... Wait, what is he doing? Don't interrupt me. Uh, uh, whatever. Anyway, time for the boss? What the hell? The world boss icon has moved to another part of the screen. How does that happen? Going back through some of the levels again, not taking more screen caps because it's the same stuff. I got through to where the icon had moved, and it moved again. Something's wrong here. I'm gonna take a break and see if I can figure this out. Alright, I thought it over for a while. I think that the cause of this is King Caesar. He wasn't unlocked like Rodan was, he just kind of showed up. It could be that his inclusion was a trick. I'm going to try getting rid of him and seeing if that solves the problem. I'm going to feel like a real dumbass if I'm wrong, but I don't know what else to do. Here goes. That did it. I knew something was off about him. I'll use Rodan to go up against the boss now. 
Salak resembles one of the lizard creatures from the fog level, except much larger. The first thing I notice is that it moves very fast, way faster than any of the previous bosses. This boss has numerous tricks up its, her, sleeve. Lashing out a tongue that drains health, tornado blasts from the wings, and heading off screen to let the kids have a turn. It's proving to be a hard battle. Salak hits Rodan with the tongue again, and health is going into critical lows. But, now we're close enough that I can lay on the damage and prevent it from flying off. It's a very close match, but I succeed. And I thought it would end there, but it doesn't. It takes me back to the map again. King Caesar is back where the boss icon was. I think he's mad about the whole dropping him into an abyss thing. Fortunately, he only has as much life as he did when I got rid of him. That should be easy. That's what you get for working for that gray bastard. Uh. Oh. Uh-oh. How very perceptive, but you didn't learn anything. Shit, I didn't even think I'd be fighting him now. I wasn't prepared for this. This might be as far as I get, but I am not going down without a fight. This guy is tough. Very tough. Godzilla is the strongest monster I have, and I'm just barely holding him off. We're both getting low on health, and he's getting serious. Now he's destroying the mountaintop, so I have less places to stand. He absorbed my heat beam. He's gaining a lot of power. Better duck. This is it. Gonna blast him with all I have left. And Warlock floats away again. Probably so he can regain his health and prepare for another attack. No doubt about it. And he knows about the journal? What exactly is he? Better question, do I even want to know? Yeah. Well, I'm physically and mentally exhausted now. This game threw a lot at me that I wasn't ready for. I don't think it's going to get any easier from here, but I can't quit now. Not until I find Usal. I'm coming for you, little buddy.